Hi, my name is Surendra Dara. I'm an entomologist with the University of California Cooperative Extension. I would like to share a few details about the invasive spotted lanternfly, which is currently distributed in some states on the East Coast. This is the spotted lanternfly. Here you see the dorsal view and uh, the side and ventral views with uh, different colors and spots and uh, um, bright patterns. Um, here what you see is uh, infestation on a tree, several spotted lanternfly adults uh, feeding on the tree. Um, the scientific name is Lycorma delicatula and it is actually a plant hopper belonging to the family Fulgaridae in the order Hemiptera and in China it is called spot clothing wax cicada or Chinese blistering cicada and in Korea it is called got Mei and um, this insect actually prefers the tree of heaven uh, which actually contains uh, high levels of uh, toxic alkaloids and it is the favorite host of uh, the spotted lanternfly and uh, spotted lanternfly also prefers hosts that have the, such a toxic uh, secondary metabolites or high those um, those hosts that have high sugar content in China it is used as a medicinal insect to relieve um, swelling um, to reduce the swelling and relieve pain. Spotted lanternfly was first detected in Pennsylvania in 2014 in Berks County and it is thought to have been there for two to three years prior to its detection and it is expected to have arrived in the United States through some kind of shipment. Um, it is actually a major threat to apples, some stone fruits, grapes, landscape trees, bushes, and also to the timber industry. Uh, it, it has been known to cause significant damage to vineyards in Korea and also uh, to some vineyards in Pennsylvania. This is the host range of spotted lanternfly, which has more than 70 species of uh, plants or trees or bushes. And we have several of them in the United States and also in California. Uh, so if it arrives in California or other states, it does have uh, plenty of food sources and some of them are of a high economic value. And this is uh, the tree of heaven, which is um, a favorite host of uh, the spotted lanternfly. And um, this is the distribution of this uh, tree in California. As you can see, it is almost everywhere throughout the state. Uh, in many places um, widely distributed and this tree was first introduced uh, from China in 1784 and it was originally um, used as a landscape tree and very soon it became a weed. Um, it actually grows 8200 feet tall and uh, it has you know a six feet uh, diameter for the trunk and it propagates either by seeds or by suckers that are produced uh, from this tree. And if we look at the life cycle, um, this is uh, the typical life cycle on the East Coast that we currently see. Uh, eggs are laid uh, from September to December and the egg period lasts from September to June of the following year then you see the first instar nymphs emerging from April to June and within a few weeks you have the second instars and uh, the, around June to July and the third instars also you see them from June to July. Uh, what you see here is that the three nymphal instars all of them are black with white markings but the last instar is red with the black and white markings which you typically see from July to September and then you start seeing adults from July to December which uh, mate and start uh, depositing eggs and in this picture what you see is this is the male uh, slightly smaller one and this is the female and the egg masses eggs are um, covered with this uh, waxy deposit which protects the eggs and allows them to overwinter. 
and this is a freshly uh, deposited and uh, you know egg mask covered with this uh, white coating um, these um, these are the adult female adults and uh, then eventually they turn dark and uh, you see them um, this is on a rock and this is how the older egg masses look and uh, this is uh, another example after of the egg masses after the nymphs have emerged you can see this is the waxy coating or hardened coating is uh, uh, disappearing here and these are dark markings uh, these are the uh, exit holes you can see these um, are all eggs where the nymphs have already emerged what these lantern flies do is that they insert their piercing and sucking mouth parts into the host plant tissue into the phloem of the host plant and they suck the sap and they also discharge large volumes of honeydew because of the feeding uh, nutrients are depleted from its host and the plant loses its vigor and uh, you know when and sutimol grows on the honeydew and sometimes they attract uh, hornets or some other insects looking for these uh, um, food that kind of food source and as a result of the feeding and loss of vigor, uh, yields are also reduced. When the damage is severe or infestations are very high, the plant might also die. What you are seeing here is dead spotted lantern flies. This is uh, two to three days after they applied pesticides. And this is the sooty mold on the leaves. And here what you see is like uh, when a vine is uh, damaged, there is a mechanical damage on the vine uh, that has been uh, uh, infested by sort of spotted lanternflies. You see large volumes of uh, these kinds of discharge. So as you can see, even uh, you know, within two to three days after applying the pesticide, you still see several adults feeding on this uh, vine. And this video is on silver maple from a residential area. As you can see, infestation is all over the tree from the trunk and branches and as far as you can see they see these flies um, they're doing some studies here and uh, they're collecting uh, these uh, flies after the treatment that's why you see this uh, um, netting here to collect them the dead lantern flies and this is the current distribution of the spotted lantern fly in the United States uh, as of now uh, it has been present in Pennsylvania West Virginia Virginia Maryland Delaware and New Jersey right now and it has also been detected in New York, Massachusetts, Connecticut, and North Carolina. And this is a study that was published last year uh, based on some modeling to um, see where it could actually, this pest could actually uh, spread and uh, uh, be a, a big problem in some areas. And this is the worldwide potential distribution of sp the spotted lantern fly. And this is uh, within the United States. And as you can see, uh, you know, it, California is at a huge risk if or when this pest arrives here and then also Oregon and Washington also are at risk. Now let us look at what invasive pests 
do in the native area and why they may or may not be a huge problem in the native um, regions. So if you look at a pest like the spotted lanternfly or any insect, um, the primary uh, factor is the host range. Does it have enough host plants or are they available only during part of the year or does it have alternative host to survive throughout the year? These are the factors that initially determine uh, its uh, population uh, presence and uh, multiplication. Then environment plays another uh, critical role here. If there are parts of the year that are not ideal for the pest to survive, then that harsh weather limits population buildup. Um, in the case of uh, the spotted lanternfly, it deposits eggs as overwintering stages and covers them with a protective waxy covering. Uh, so they are able to avoid a harsh environment and be able to survive um, as eggs uh, during the winter period. Then mutualists like ants or some other uh, you know um, um, like hornets and some other uh, insects or other animals could also play a role uh, for example if there are biocontrol agents uh, ants when they form a relationship with the insects such as the spotted lanternfly that produce honeydew they try to uh, tend to these pests and protect them from these uh, biocontrol agents so if there is a, a predatory arthropod or a parasitic um, arthropod uh, insect that tries to attack their uh, host these mutualists provide some protection because they are using these pests for their you know part of their food source and then um, the other factors could be is there a competition from other pest species like uh, you know beetles or uh, caterpillars or other plant hoppers uh, do they have do they also occur on the same host and compete for the same food uh, source they also play a role in controlling these populations. Then we can look at some of these uh, pathogens like the fungal pathogens. So these are examples of uh, um, entomophthorelian or hypocrealian uh, fungi. Either they're naturally occurring or used um, as inundative sprays in that area. So these are some of the options that, that might be limiting uh, a pest population in its native area. Then we have these uh, predatory arthropods and uh, parasitoids, which also attack different uh, life stages of a pest. And then also possibly other kinds of predators uh, like lizards or birds that might attack them. So when all these um, factors play the role, a population, the population of a pest um, is balanced more or less uh, to a level that uh, can be managed uh, locally. But when these pests go to a new area like uh, the United States in the case of this uh, sp uh, spotted lanternfly, all they have is plenty of food and the environment also seems to be ideal for it to continue. As a result of that, they might be multiplying in the absence of other limiting factors. So we end up seeing this as a problem. So this is what typically happens with invasive pests when they go to a new area and when they don't have these uh, various uh, biotic or abiotic factors that are limiting uh, their population buildup. So now that we have the spotted lanternfly in the United States, what is that we can do to address this pest? The first thing is that we need to manage the pest and um, develop quarantine measures so that we can stop the pest and its spread to other areas. And then we have to conduct extensive research to understand its biology and how it is reacting to the local environmental factors and also what kind of control options we do we have and then we have to uh, disseminate that information. So these are not necessarily in the order I presented but we need to uh, work on the quarantine management research and outreach whenever we have a, an invasive pest. 
So each pest actually uh, uses different uh, means to for its dispersal and spotted lanternfly has this adaptation to deposit eggs on inanimate objects so it has uh, uh, some advantages for its uh, spread for example if there is a spotted lanternfly that um, deposits egg, its eggs on a box the reason i am using this example is that uh, there is apparently um, a distribution center for a shipping company near the vineyard I visited in Pennsylvania last year. So they, let us imagine that there is this uh, spot and lanternfly flies from this vineyard, goes to this area, and just as the boxes are being loaded onto a truck, um, it deposits X and then you know the truck is taking this box to wherever it is supposed to go and this being looking like a, uh, a splash of mud um, the receiver may not notice or even if they notice they don't see that it is uh, probably an egg mass or something related to an insect or something they have to uh, take do something about and when they discard that package and imagine the you know eggs mature and then the names emerge and eventually uh, they might infest um, any suitable host in its uh, in that area so the same thing can happen when the spotted lanternfly deposit its eggs on a vehicle and the vehicle goes to a different area and then um, you know if that uh, egg mass is not noticed or removed then insects emerge and then infestation uh, can occur in that new area too and here we see a study uh, by kelly um, and her postdoc at uh, penn state so what they're trying to do is they have different host plants uh, in these cages and they're trying to see if a spotted lanternfly uh, completes its life cycle on those hosts and they recently found out that it can complete its life, life cycle without um, the tree of heaven and this work is uh, about to be published and outreach this is what is being done in Pennsylvania and some other states uh, that are seeing the spotted lanternfly infestation um, aggressive outreach is very important when we have a pest like this so they you see these signs like this and stickers on vehicles and then you know uh, posters or um, you know various means of uh, um, advertisement channels to alert people about this pest and also these kinds of uh, brochures are telling them people to be aware of it and uh, report if they see them and also um, inspect their vehicles if they happen to be um, in the moving from in, in from the infested areas to other areas and uh, let us look at some um, behaviors of this uh, pest it looks like it is attracted to tall structures and uh, trees uh, they can fly but usually they are carried uh, to other places uh, by the wind currents so when they see these uh, tall structures they land on them and they might either deposit eggs there or the or they um, look for other holes in that area and uh, when i was uh, visiting this vineyard and you know we were looking at uh, their behavior where they actually deposit eggs and it looks like they um, tend to deposit their eggs on the underside of these uh, posts and uh, trellises or uh, the branches which are more protected um, uh, from the sun and then um, what are some control options that we have to address this pest removing the tree of heaven appears to be one of the strategies that is uh, recommended so what they say is remove 85 percent of the trees um, and keep only the male trees and then treat those male trees with the systemic insecticides so these male trees act as uh, traps so when the spotted lanternfly is attracted to them and feeds on them because of the insecticides they you know die and then uh, uh, sticky uh, uh, these uh, sticky bands placed on the trunks 
is another way to control but it appears that uh, some small birds are you know attached to this so they are talking about putting some kind of a wire mesh at some distance from the traps uh, the the sticky bands uh, so that these birds don't get it um, attached and die and then uh, other means are biological control options so here what we are seeing is this is OO insertus uh, um, the these are uh, tiny wasps they were in they were brought into the united states uh, for controlling um, the gypsy moth um, more, more than 100 years ago and they seem to be uh, attacking the spotted lanternfly eggs and they also have super parasitism which means um, multiple um, they, they can uh, you know you can have multiple um, individuals of this parasitoid within each egg and they seem to be uh, attacking these um, um, parasitoid wasps seem to be attacking spotted lanternfly eggs and then exploration has also been done for an exploration this is a, a, a very standard way of controlling invasive pests uh, as I mentioned earlier when you have an invasive pest in its new area and there are no natural enemies to control them um, then it prospers so uh, researchers typically go to its native area and look for natural enemies that keep these uh, pests under control and they try to bring them and uh, raid them and conduct a lot of studies to make sure that it can uh, survive and multiply in its new area and effectively control the pest and at the same time it does not cause any damage to non-target organisms so these researchers uh, from usda and uh, university of massachusetts um, have been uh, studying um, conducting foreign explorations for these natural enemies and conducting some studies uh, so here we have two biocontrol agents. Uh, the one is Anastasis um, status orientalis, uh, which is an egg parasitoid, and then uh, Dryinus stantoni, which is a nymphal parasitoid. And it looks like um, this egg parasitoid seems to be uh, providing a decent uh, control in the lab studies, and uh, it is uh, currently uh, under investigation in the United States now. And um, then this is the nymphal parasitoid. Uh, what it does is, um, you know, it attacks the nymphs, and then um, um, as it is developing inside the nymph uh, during the um, um, the late stage larva, kind of comes up in the sense like it, it forms this sac and uh, um, spends some time there, and then emerges and pupates, and then. Um, adult emerges eventually it looks like a both uh, for the both egg parasitoid and the nymphal parasitoid adults also seem to be feeding on the uh, not just the eggs and then the, their um, grubs feeding on inside of these uh, eggs or nymphs of the spotted lanternfly but adults also seem to be feeding so providing extra control what we are seeing here is um, an adult spotted lanternfly infected and killed by Batcova major, an entomophthorian fungus. Uh, this fungus causes natural um, episodics. It cannot be cultured in artificial media to be developed into a biopesticide. But when it occurs naturally and when the host populations are um, plenty and the environmental conditions are ideal it can be a huge mortality factor in the host and they also noticed another fungus buvaria bassiana uh, infecting um, in the same um, area so they saw both this uh, bat co major and buvaria bassiana infecting spotted lanternfly buvaria bassiana belongs to another group of uh, fungi uh, called hypocreolians and there are several um, biopesticides based on this fungus or different strains of this fungus what um, uh, clifton et al noticed is that uh, these infections and they saw that uh, the that dead insects uh, on the ground were more infected by uh, buvaria bassiana 
uh, compared to uh, you know Batco being a major um, mortality in the insects on the tree. So they seem to be uh, occupying different areas within that uh, uh, within that micro environment. And then there were also some studies, Cooper Band and others uh, did some studies with some lures and it looks like, uh, you know, methyl salicylate is attracted to all nymphs and adults, whereas the other two materials uh, were attractive to older nymphs and adults. So now there are actually commercially available lures based on methyl salicylate. Uh, so these, uh, you know, putting out these lures helps to monitor uh, infestations and also sometimes, uh, you know, at, um, attract and kill in certain situations. But at least uh, for now, they're useful to uh, detect if there is any spotted lanternfly infestation in that area. And um, studies uh, have been done evaluating various um, uh, chemical and non-chemical uh, insecticides and it looks like neonicotinoids, organophosphates and then this botanical insecticide azoderectin and some insecticidal soaps uh, can be used and, uh, and various entomopathogenic fungal formulations are also available. Um, some studies are being uh, conducted um, to you, you uh, trying different uh, commercial formulations of these fungi, uh, Bavaria bassiana, Isaria fumosorosia, and we will soon have some data on that when those uh, studies are published. If you look at the evolutionary adaptations of the spotted lanternfly, you will understand why it is a successful insect. First of all, it has a wide host range, uh, which means it has more options to feed on and survive um, compared to other insects which have narrow host range. And then it also prefers hosts with the toxic secondary metabolites, which uh, kind of deter these uh, natural enemies. And similarly, the size and bright coloration can warn um, um, predators. Uh, this um, feature is called aposematism, which is uh, like uh, giving out a warning that you can eat me at your own risk. So that also kind of protects this uh, insect. Then the host searching behavior. When the pest detects that uh, the nutrients, uh, nutrient quality of the host um, is no longer preferred, it seems to be moving on to uh, other hosts. Um, there, it, it requires a certain turgid pressure within the plant so that it is easy for the insect to suck this uh, phloem sap. So when uh, the pressure decreases, uh, which is also like an indication that uh, the, the nutritional quality has decreased, it tries to move on to another healthier host. And then overwintering as an egg uh, is another adaptation for it because you know it, it does not have to go and search for food or feed uh, during those harsh winter months and it overwinters as an egg which is protected by this uh, hard covering. So that is also another advantage for it to survive those uh, difficult parts of the year. And um, as I mentioned, the protective cover on the egg masses, and then uh, appearance of the egg masses. They don't. They look like a splash of mud. So, which is, uh, um, you know, which is a higher chance of uh, getting away from being detected and uh, um, destroyed. And egg laying on inanimate objects is another big advantage. If it is only, uh, if it. Uh, prefers only live plants or trees, then moving those uh, uh, plants can be uh, restricted or some of those, you know, usually we may not be distribution, distributing this uh, plant material all over, but when it can deposit eggs on vehicles or equipment or any kind of uh, uh, non-living material, then they have a better chance of uh, getting distributed and uh, dispersing to newer areas. And then now we will look at some IPM strategies. And the first thing is 
uh, we need to aggressively uh, spread the message about this pest. That's uh, one of the reasons um, for starting this outreach in a state like California. We do not have this pest yet, but uh, we should be prepared. We should know what this pest looks like and uh, what the different stages actually look like and uh, the potential damage so that um, it can cause so that we can be aware of its uh, potential arrival and take appropriate measures to prevent its spread. So this is what we want to do with that outreach. And then uh, what we can do with the egg masses. So we have to, when we detect them, we have to destroy them and uh, you know prevent the movement of these egg masses on these objects or vehicles. And also we can employ these biocontrol agents uh, whether the ones that we already have in this country or those that are being uh, investigated right now in different states, including uh, California. And then potentially looking at some ovicidal treatments. Uh, so, you know, when you spray these, they might uh, um, kind of uh, uh, remove these uh, protective covering and then kill these eggs. And then what can we do with these uh, nymphal stages? So it is the same thing. We could employ biocontrol agents or we could use these uh, entomopathogenic fungi, um, especially the ones that we have as commercial formulations. And uh, then chemical insecticide uh, treatments can be used, or chemical or botanical insecticide treatments. And then using these uh, uh, sticky bands on the trunks to trap some of them. And then we, to address the adults, again, we can employ this biological control, microbial control, uh, using insecticidal treatments or uh, sticky bands. And um, then uh, finally, um, you know, removing the tree of heaven because, you know, you want to reduce a potential host range, but we don't know how effective this is going to be, um, uh, especially if the, these trees are everywhere, but that is also, uh, you know, one option, removing them and uh, treat the remaining ones with systemic insecticide so that these are used as a trap trees to control them. Uh, so here um, is um, um, where you can find um, our first uh, publication about this pest. It provides uh, complete details about um, where it came from and what is the host range and uh, the biology and some potential management options. But there are several recent publications that address uh, that provide a lot more information about uh, um, these uh, studies with biocontrol agents and uh, pesticides and other um, you know means of uh, strategies for controlling it. And uh, here is a video um, to give a full overview of the biology and host range and management options for the spotted lanternfly. Finally, this is my contact information. If um, there are any questions, uh, you can contact me using you know, one or more of these uh, um, channels. And thank you for your attention.